It is my pleasure next to introduce Dr. Craig Wax. He is a family physician that practices full spe spectrum family medicine and health through prevention. He is a tireless advocate for the patient-physician relationship and free market health care. He is the health talk show host and executive producer for Your Health Matters on Rowan Radio 89, WGLS FM, since 2002. His website is www.wgls.rowan.edu. Dr. Wax was honored by the Society of Professional Journalists of Philadelphia with an SPJ award for his ability to make complicated matters simple to understand. Dr. Wax is frequently published in Medical Economics Journal and spent seven years on the editorial board. He began educating the public on the web and health is number one, health is number one dot com, excuse me, since he created it in 1999. Dr. Wax is an avid year-round cyclist, swimmer, and general fitness athlete and authority on human nutrition with a bachelor's degree in food and science research from Rutgers University in New Jersey. And now it is my pleasure to welcome up Dr. Craig Wax and to once again thank him for being a moderator uh, for this program all this week. And thank I'll do that to you, you my friend. That's so what we need. We need contact and we need action. Those are the things we need. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Uh, Cravioto, Dr. Strickland, Dr. Thompson, and all of those involved in the uh, United Physicians and Surgeons of America and making it possible for me to speak with you today and moderate um, the conference. I'd like to also thank Andrea Barry, uh, the management, and the folks uh, doing the uh, work back there in the audiovisual department, and Barbara Diaz for taking care of all travel details. Thank you. This is the traditional caregiver. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Saturday Evening Post version of uh, this picture. If you look on the right side, it's the patient, the family, and the community. And you look on the left side, it's the physician, nurse, and staff, which was the health care team. And care went to the patient, the family, and therefore the community. And the payment was direct, and it went from the patient to the physician, the nurse, and the staff. How has that changed in the present day? Here's the postmodern caregiver. On the right, you'll still see the patient, community, and family. On the left, from the top to the bottom, which I guess that's how they would have me read it, is the federal government, including the president, Congress, and now the Supreme Court has weighed in and even changed existing laws. There's the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, which is there now to penalize you if you don't buy the prescribed health insurance in a timely fashion from approved vendors. There's HHS, Health and Human Services, which is in charge of CMS and not the Colorado Medical Society, although they were first to use CMS, I'm told, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. There's the insurance industry. There's the pharmaceutical industry. Of course, as the physicians and other people have spoke about over the course of the conference, the health information technology industry and the not ready for prime time electronic health record, which serves to, to stifle and fragment the patient doctor, rather, rather the patient physician relationship rather than unify it and connect everybody as it was potentially well intended to do. There's organized medicine, the American Medical Association and the American Osteopathic Association that have followed the top of the pyramid's lead. And as Dr. Cravioto said, it's not coming up from the bottom, from the physicians and the patients who are doing the work. It's coming down from the top, which is uh, completely unacceptable. Of course, there's the hospital health system, which the government has incentivized in this circumstance. And I don't know if you've shopped around, but there's no place, even a car dealership, that you could buy something that's as expensive and as marked up as hospital stuff. I can get a $38 x-ray at the hospital in the city of Philadelphia for $1,140 if I don't have insurance because of the facility fee that the hospitals charge. But the ACA, or as I call it, the Unaffordable Careless Act, because it was unaffordable and it was passed carelessly without anybody actually reading it, you had to pass it to see what was in it. 
and they advantage the hospital care systems in their quest for profit for their shareholders. And again, at the bottom, probably should be in smaller print at the moment, physician, nurse, and staff. So how did we get here? All right, our daunting task is 100 years worth of history in 30 minutes, go. On government, this is Frederick Bastiat, who was a uh, French economist. He said, government is the great fiction through which everybody in endeavors to live at the expense of everybody else. This was my reading on the plane coming. If ever you have a moment and you can read 54 pages, read The Law by Frederick Bastiat, and you'll understand where we are, where we're going, and why we're in a handbasket. He said that in 1850. So this is the old-fashioned caregiver. Again, uh, a classic picture there. A caregiver is a person who gives care to someone who is sick or young or older and needs help. And as parents, um, I'm the proud parent, uh, along with my wife, of four lovely children, and all they're great kids, they require a lot of work. We're trying to make responsible individuals out of them and empower them to think on their feet and not just echo back what the world tells them. So we're trying to foster independence. That's what parents do. Over the course of 18 years or 21 years, and now the government says 26 years, <laughs> you're supposed to foster independence of some sort. So I believe in 18 to 21 myself and uh, reasonable milestones along the way. There's the Hippocratic Oath and the Osteopathic Oath, which basically empower us as physicians that we're supposed to do the right thing every time at any cost for all patients all the time. It's a daunting task, but we took it on. We invested in that. Having said that, physicians also foster patient independence. We teach them about their bodies, um, what they should eat, what they should do, if medication is appropriate, what their activities should be. So we want patients to be independent of us. I've always said my best patient is someone that I can empower with information. They can come back once a year, do a physical and testing. I tell them how great they are. Go home, have fun with your family. I'll see you in a year. That's my maximum screening. And that's my, uh, what, what I look for. Now, government, of course, fosters dependence through so-called entitlements or handouts at taxpayer expense. And what they do is that they constantly give and 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 give. Unfortunately, that doesn't teach the person they're trying to help anything. There's no, there's no issues where that they're, they learn. And that's where the whole government model falls down. So government intervention began very young, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, you could probably say 1776, but we'll say 1789 for the sake of argument. Congress established the U.S. Marine Hospital Service, which sounds great because it's to take care of, of the Marines and seamen that were protecting our country, except the service was funded by compulsory contributions from seamen's wages. So the government was already garnishing wages to provide a benefit, a potential benefit. In 1912, there was a convention of insurance commissioners that developed the first model for state law to regulate health insurance because the states were supposed to be the ones who regulated health insurance. That was the plan from that point. From 1915 to 1930, there were many efforts in 16 states that I know of for compulsory health insurance programs, and they failed in all 16 states at that point. In 1939, the Revenue Act established the tax exclusion for different compensations through work, like workers' comp, accident insurance, and health insurance. And in 1943, um, during World War II, the War, the War Labor Board said that the freeze on wages that the government mandated doesn't apply to fringe benefits, and therefore the employer-sponsored health insurance was born. Now that, of course, was an issue because we saw that through decades and decades and decades further disconnecting the patient and the physician who did the care. Your employer was now picking out your benefits and what your responsibilities are when it should be an individual decision. If you want to have insurance at all, it should be your right to choose. In 1948, the McCarran-Ferguson Act gave states more rights to regulate insurance. So now we have states regulating their own insurance, but the Fed has also weighed in, but the Fed had yet to weigh in major. There are two ways of organizing an economy, according to Murray Rothbard, who's an economist. One is by freedom and voluntary choice. That is the way of the market. The other is by force and dictation, which is the way of the state. 
Guess which one we're doing at the moment. And if anybody wants to follow this sort of information, there's another good book you can read um, called The Road to Serfdom. I recommend it. It's, uh, I'm going to be rereading it on the flight home and uh, during my layover in the airport just to uh, refresh myself on those issues. That was uh, by Frederick Hayek, H-A-Y-E-K. So what was the AMA doing turn of the last century and up until the, the middle of the 1900s? Well, the AMA was fighting. They were fighting government intrusion into medicine. In fact, 65% of doctors were in the AMA as of 1950, 1965 time frame. Elmer Henderson, who was the president, he said, and this is a very important foreshadowing quote, American medicine has become the focal point in the fundamental struggle which may determine whether America remains free or whether we become a socialized state. He was referring to the U.S. President Truman's plan for national health insurance. He called it an old world scourge that would seriously endanger the health of the new world. It turns out he was right. So 1965, here we are, Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, passed uh, Medicare and Medicaid into being. Billions for schools, aged, Medicare, and the war on poverty. If you look at the data, the war on poverty has spent billions and billions of dollars. Have we actually lifted anybody out of poverty? Having said all of that, just as a symbol, the White House uh, signing ceremony where LBJ signed the legislation, he enrolled President Truman as the first Medicare beneficiary and, prevented, and presented him with his first card. So there was a time when presidents were actually involved in uh, with the benefits that uh, you know, they purport to, to others, as well as President Truman hadn't paid a dime in. So that to me is a Ponzi scheme, that person didn't pay in their whole life, all of a sudden they're getting mandatory benefits paid for with tax dollars and mandatory contributions from your wages. So eh, not a great start. So here's where the health care rationing comes in over the last, over the last 60 to 70 years. I mentioned Medicare. Um, Medicaid was also made law, but not for the Fed, but for states to administer. And now they're involved in that too. In 1973, President Richard Nixon passed the HMO Act, bringing those into being, or health maintenance organizations, so to speak. In 1983, and this was a big issue as well, CMS adopts the AMA's trademark CPT, the current procedural terminology, which has been used for all of the billing interactions. And it part of the bane of our existence, other than ICD-9 becoming ICD-10, becoming ICD-11, and whatever other language they wish for us to speak at a moment's notice to get paid for the service we already performed. But that was a big transformational moment in the AMA. In my opinion, that is when the AMA stopped respecting and taking care of their physicians and started heeding the government step. In 1980s, the PPOs, or participating provider organizations, came into being. You signed an insurance contract, and they said, doctor, we'll pay you for procedures, but because we're going to send you all these patients, we're going to pay you much less for each procedure. So you're going to make less on each pizza, but you're going to have to make more pizzas, whatever you want to do. So, of course, because patients had insurance, their demand for procedures went up, and the number of procedures went up. And in 1990s, the HMA boom, uh, HMO boom came, where global capitation was paid per person. Um, companies like U.S. Healthcare that morphed into Aetna, it was $5 per member per month. I don't know the first doctor who thought that was okay, but if I do work for a patient, I wish to get paid a fair rate. If I don't do work for a patient, I don't deserve a nickel. It's very, very simple. It's a very one-to-one -one relationship that has multiple intermediaries right now. And we know that that made the demand for procedures increase by patients. There was decreased pay, so the financial risk was put on the physicians and the hospitals. And in the beginning of the 90s, hospitals were buying physicians' practices and paying them a salary. And by the end of the 90s, the HMO revolution blew up and the hospitals had the great privilege of firing all the doctors that they had hired in haste 10 years before. In 2000, another major 
step that the uh, federal government took into uh, our industry and patient care was the ACA, Obamacare, and now MACRA and MIPS. And I, I don't know what a MIP is. I'm pretty good with those sorts of uh, acronyms. However, it has to do with the elimination of pay for procedure and the SGR or sustainable growth rate. In fact, they called it a sustainable growth rate, but it wasn't sustainable. So everybody cried about it and made a lot of noise. So they retracted it, but in the past year, the Congress passed legislation to the American Medical Association's delight and the American Osteopathic Association's delight to remove the SGR, but to put in place a new system we've never heard of called MIPS, which was going to incentivize us to keep people well. They haven't told us how. There's no real formula, and there's no real one-to-one -one way to do it, to take care of patients. And of course, the global capitation would be to ACOs, which are hospital health systems, which, as I said, aren't efficient to begin with, and the government is increasing their response on that. There's now an, in an increased demand for procedures by patients because they're waving a card. I have a card. I want all the procedures in the world. I want them now, and I don't want to pay you the $10 I'm supposed to pay you for them. Very, very simple. So now the government and the hospital health care system through ACOs are going to ration care. How are they going to do it? the physicians. The physicians are going to be the bag men and women for that issue. The government is going to say to hospitals, we're not paying you if you don't stop doing this. And the hospitals are going to say to doctors, we're not going to pay you unless you stop doing this. Guess what happens? What do we do? So this is a little bit about CPT, a little bit more about the AMA's involvement in all of that. This was written in uh, 2011 by uh, Avic Roy, who I've had the privilege of presenting with as well uh, at other meetings. The AMA developed a proprietary system, as I mentioned before. And at this time, only 10% of doctors, approximately, no one knows the exact real number, are part of the AMA. So they no longer represent physicians. And their bread is no longer buttered on that side. As I said before, uh, I'm not for bread or butter, but the analogy is the important part. Having said all of that, they make millions and millions and millions of dollars on selling their billing and coding of CPT codes. It's proprietary. Medicare and Medicaid can't use anybody else. And of course, all the other insurers have gone in, in lockstep along with that. And in 2010, five years ago, the AMA made $72 million in royal royalties and credentialing products to sell that product. They no longer represent physicians. They no longer represent patients. They represent themselves making money in all of this. In fact, Avic Roy went on to say in his article why the American Medical Association had 72 million reasons to shrink doctors' pay. He said, and I quote, the AMA pricing policy is a total racket. Meet the stakeholders we've all heard about. Now, for me, in healthcare, the stakeholder was on that first slide. It was the patient, it was the family, it was the community. And the stakeholders were the doctor, the nurse, and the staff, the office. However, these are the stakeholders that the government and special interests want to introduce you to. And I can introduce them um, from the center out because the politicians are the first one. They're in the center. To the right is uh, big business. To the right, of course, is the hospital association because they must profit over this, although they don't pay any taxes. And how they make these gargantuan profits and the CEOs make millions of dollars, which would be OK if they made it honestly, they don't pay taxes. In our office, we pay taxes. Hospitals don't. And that's a major issue also. If you look to the left of the politicians or the insurers, because of course they have a, a, a hands out relationship, they call the, in medicine we call it the waiter's tip deformity. That is to say, I'm waiting for my tip and then I'll perform for you. And then big pharma is there as well. Where are the patients and where are the physicians? I don't believe they're at the table. The financial capture of healthcare um, has, has been unstoppable, but we do have means to stop it, and we will discuss those at the end of the talk. The growth of physicians and administrators from 1970 to 2009. You'll see the physician line is on the bottom in red, and it's just increasing slightly linearly over time as med schools increased and funding for uh, physician training increased. Look at the administrators. It's gone up exponentially 
exponentially. It tells the tale. If you look between 1980 and 1985, when the AMA CP co CPT codes were made proprietary, the billing and coding industry was born. Look by 1990. It's almost a straight up line that goes up. And in the 2000s, with the government, the federal government getting involved in healthcare directly and involving the IRS, it's gone up again. The great healthcare bloat. There are 10 administrators for every one U.S. doctor. That was reported in 2013. The Harvard Business Review analysis also shows that the healthcare workforce has grown by 75% since 1990, which sounds encouraging. However, 95% of new hires aren't physicians. So who are they? Administrators? So this is all in to regulate and capture health care. So any special interest group with money can lobby the state and the Fed and get their way in health care and sell some sort of product. And if you can, make it mandatory. That way you've got to buy it, like maintenance of certification or any of the other things that physicians are, are being forced to do in this system, which uh, potentially don't empower physicians to be independent leaders, to take care of patients as independent thinking patients. So you can see the alphabet soup on the left and on the right was my uh, article. It started out tongue in cheek and got serious by the end in 2012 in medical economics. Healthcare crushed by acronyms. So here we are at the glorious halls of medicine that have, have existed for hundreds if not thousands of years. What do we have at the gates? It is the electronic health records Trojan horse. By all means, we're being told this horse is a it's to our dedication as far as physicians to take care of patients. Bring it right inside. After all, the federal government wouldn't force us to buy something that wasn't helpful, right? I'm going to quote uh, former President Ronald Reagan. The nine most terrifying words from the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. This is a little bit about the regulatory capture of health care, as the previous physicians who spoke before me talked about. The HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Privacy Act of 1996, um, as other speakers have pointed out, it doesn't necessarily guarantee you privacy. However, if someone breaks your privacy, it does guarantee that there will be a huge monetary fine and possibly jail time with regard to that. And when you sign your HIPAA rights, it's not that you get your rights, it's that you know that your rights can be violated by the insurance industry, the government industry, and any other industry that's HIPAA waived. So privacy is fleeting, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the true nature of government regulation, in my opinion. The federal government regulations claim they're all about helping citizens, maintaining privacy and security. The reality is, is that government regulations are all about penalties, both monetary and punitive. They're not all about the base, as uh, the current popular song is. They're about, about patients and physicians, but they're all about the top. Not the base, but the top, the government administrators. And as my longtime colleague, Dr. Alita Eck, and former AAPS president asked, will Atlas shrug? If you look at the cartoon, you see the man who caused the um, data breach in the stocks because of HIPAA issues. The, the, what's wrong with this cartoon is the physician would also be in the stocks as well. And if the person who caused the breach worked for the government, there would be no stocks. There would be a stipend, and they would just disappear. So EHR, how many of you have used them? We've all used them, various and different ones. Anyone love theirs couldn't practice without it. You know, it's interesting. I never, ever see a hand that goes up at that point in time, any of the major mainstream EHRs. The first case scenario, as far as the physician or office practice, it can cost up to $46,000 for implementation. It changes all established workflows. It requires expensive ongoing training. A doctor in solo practice like myself, myself becomes the IT help desk. So when I'm doing a procedure or taking care of a patient, the front desk calls in, I'm sorry, we've lost the internet and I've been logged out of the EHR. Can you please help me with my password? I, I, I thought that that was supposed to serve what I was doing in the office, not the other way around. Having said all of that, privacy data breaches, which I've been talking about for the last 10 years, huge potential penalties with the HIPAA and High Tech Act, malfunctions cost time and money. And you can't be a doctor without cable 
internet, or electricity. In fact, we had our first tornado in South Jersey, turned over cars, split houses in half, turned over trees. I came to work the next day. We had no power. We had no electronics. We had no internet. I opened the windows. I saw patients with paper charts. And 12 very happy patients got to spend extra time with Dr. Wax, who they like and trust. And we did their healthcare business on paper. And it worked out very well. And nobody's data was breached. And no penalties were necessary. Study looks for can't find much evidence of e-health benefits, says the Wall Street Journal in 2011. In fact, in, there's a University of Florida study, uh, I believe it was from 2013 or 2014, that says doctors who use EHR tend to miss the depression diagnosis. Because if you think about it, how is your doctor when he or she's using an EHR? So tell me a little bit about the problem. Can you please tell me about your sexual history also? Do you smoke? Do you drink? And meantime, the patient is saying, I have a problem here. I have pain. I have something devastating. I might need to be hospitalized. I trust you. And you're asking me questions? Let's move on to the examination phase, shall we? But as you know, EHRs, um, like government websites, won't allow you to move to the next page until you've filled in every blank. So that's uh, going to be really important to get paid under the MIPS strategy. Now we know what MIPS is, don't we, from the Fed. Hit implementations or health information technology negatively impact clinical workflow. Health data management, as, as recent as July 16 of 2015 said that. HIT negatively impacts clinical workflow. Well, this is all about the clinical workflow. That was my belief. The risk of insurance and government money recoupment the government, if you jump through all the hoops, they may give you stage one, stage two, meaningful use, or as Dr. Strickland called it on my radio show, he had, uh, I called it meaningless use, but he said meaningless, meaningful use for whom? Having said that, the government giveth and the government taketh away. That went for employer-sponsored health insurance, because that's going away, and it'll be for all of the reimbursement for EHR. And by the way, after 2015, there's no revenue stream for that, so whatever you're spending, you'll be spending that out of your own budget. You can't ask the patients for it and the insurance companies won't pay you anymore. The regulatory capture of healthcare through EHR, electronic health records as the Trojan horse and a remote control for other parties. Wall Street Journal says major glitch. Huh, we hear the word glitch again with regard to this, the government. A major glitch for digitized healthcare records. Savings promised by government and vendors of information technology are little more than hype. This was 2012. The AMA talked about the legal risks of going paperless, though they're trying to get us to do it and trying to tell us how to do it. They're telling us they can create liability issues with discovery and other things. Get ready. Data breaches and HIPAA fines are increasing. Prepare for the perfect storm, says healthcare business and technology. Let's go back to some of the founders of our country, and I come from the southern New Jersey, Philadelphia area, so I thought Benjamin Franklin uh, from Poor Richard's Almanac would be a good quote here. Any society that would give up a little liberty to gain a little security will deserve neither and lose both. Welcome to the new healthcare system under the ACA, Obamacare, and MACRA, which amplifies and staples the uh, Obamacare system in place. This was actually done by healthcare policy and budget analyst Dean Clancy, who I've had the privilege of also working with uh, in Washington, D.C. You can see at the center of it all, the center of the healthcare uni universe should be the patient. It's the Secretary of Health and Human Services from the government. Does anybody notice this? Straight above it is the IRS. To the far left is the president. To the far right is Congress. I have yet to see the physician or patient in this model at all. And how many circles do we need to perform health care? How many circles do we need? Patient, physician, staff. So my quote for this is ACA Obamacare doubles down on all the worst of private insurance, single payer, and government malignant ineptocracy. This is the American treasure philosopher Thomas Sowell on socialized medicine. It is amazing that people who think we cannot afford to pay for doctors, hospitals, and medication somehow think we can afford to pay for doctors, hospitals, medication, and a government bureaucracy to administer it. 
Think about that for a minute. Again, popular music. Welcome to the new age, the new age. I hope my kids will forgive me at home, but I listen to what you listen to sometimes. Welcome to the age of big data and rampant violation of your privacy and security. On the left is a cartoon representation of what the government and special interests want us to believe we're building some marvelous healthcare structure that will work seamlessly from end to end, requiring very little oil, very little maintenance, and perfection comes out the other side. But we all know a different story. My article for Medical Economics in 2011, data equals power, patients and their physicians should own it. And I'm sure Twyla Brace of the Citizens Council for Healthcare Freedom is smiling somewhere in the audience. Okay, government, privacy, security, and accountability. Any? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? All quiet. Sorry about the movie reference, but uh, I'm a dated individual. Having said all of that, well, I'd like to introduce you to the uh, former director, Catherine Archuleta, who was sworn in to testify before Congress literally just weeks ago, because after a month of going back and forth, we finally determined that the head of the Office of Personnel Management, that is the HR division of the federal government that does everything hiring-wise for the entire federal government and holds all of that precious data, including those with high security clearances, was breached of all 20 mil 1 million members of that database. It was the largest in government history, a massive hack of security clearance information. Can you imagine a larger problem? Gosh, let's hope not. And this is who we've put in charge of our healthcare system passively. These are some of the organizations that have been involved. I just wanted to go over some of the highlights of getting involved and what, what they've done. Of course, there's the UPSA, which was kind enough to put on on this conference today, United Physicians and Surgeons. There's D4PC. We've had several lecturers um, who were well involved in uh, D4PC, including Hal Schurz and Dr. Rich Armstrong, uh, who have lectured uh, this very week for Doctors for Patient Care. There's the CCHF, the Citizens Council for Health Freedom, and there's the Information Service, which I'm a part of, Independent Physicians for Patient Independence, at IP, the number 4PI on uh, Twitter if you want to follow along. And of course, there's the granddaddy of them all, the AAPS, the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. They've been a voice for private physicians serving patients since 1943. From 1943 to 1965, they fought the creation of government entitlements like Medicare. In 1992, through legal means, they fought and defeated Hillary Care, the federalized social medicine monstrosities first coming before Obamacare overwhelmed everybody, passed in the dark of night near Christmas Eve on a weekend with deals made in the back rooms that none of us knew about. From 2010 to the present, AAPS has fought ACA Obamacare and the new MACRA, which is the extension of Obamacare that puts MIPS into place, which is how we're going to pay physicians with a new and unique system that's going to defraud physicians and patients of their care. And they work toward full repeal. In 2012, AAPS uh, defeated a pilot of maintenance of licensure through maintenance of certification in Ohio, led by a friend and colleague that I've, again, had the privilege of lecturing with, Dr. Paul Kempen, and thank you for that fine work. The AAPS is also fighting the FSMB, the Federation of State Medical Boards, which is now trying to usurp your state's ability to license physicians by making a federal interstate licensure compact, which means that the Fed is going to say that, well, all the states can just accept each other's licensure processes, and we're going to take charge of that. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? If you have a problem with a license in a state, you can move to another state. You can clear your good name. You can move on. However, if the FSMB is in charge of your license, nowhere to move to. Having said all that, in 2014, they sued uh, ABMS, the American Board of Medical Specialties, in federal court to stop maintenance of certification and especially leading to maintenance of licensure. 
which is pure tyranny as far as physicians are concerned. In fact, uh, a previous lecture earlier this week, um, Kirk Eichenwald from Newsweek had a huge article in the mainstream media, and we thank him for that. In 2015, the AAPS lead counsel, Andy Schlafly, who does outstanding work for physicians, for patients, filed an amicus brief with Superior Court to protect patient record privacy against government intrusion, which were always under attack. So, where's the big money slide? What did I come for? How can I protect myself and my family? Get involved from your health to the actions that you take. Number one, take best care of yourself and your family's health. Drink water, eat right, exercise daily, get sleep, and don't poison yourself. There's plenty of them. In my opinion, 90% of the supermarket is garbage. However, there's 10% of food there. And in the farmer's market, there's probably 80-90% food there. So that might be a good place for you to shop. Guard all your data well, including paper and electronic both in use, storage, and on the web. The minute you touch the web, potentially it's no longer yours. Don't share your data. Don't permit unauthorized sharing. Work to repeal laws that usurp your right to choose, such as phony entitlements, such as ACA, Obamacare, and forced contributions to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid participation with no choice. There is no opt-out for people. You have to pay, and then you have to take what you get at the discretion of the politicians. Fight for and buy traditional, inexpensive, catastrophic health insurance where available. Unfortunately, federal law has made it unavailable. So your $5,000 catastrophic plan with a $10,000 deductible is now a $30,000 mandatory or the IRS comes down on you insurance plan and it still is a $10,000 deductible. Doesn't make any sense. And uh, Dr. George, who presented earlier this week, also said the use of health cost sharing plans, which sounds like a very interesting and innovative idea, which is permitted by law. Thank you for sharing that with us. The use of health savings accounts to purchase care on the free market with pre-tax dollars. Use direct care where possible. Pay your physician directly at a mutually agreeable price, like you would buy any other good or service. Direct primary care. Seek out physicians who appreciate these things and use record keeping methods that are consistent with your risk tolerance even if you have to pay extra as Dr. Marcy Zwelling presented earlier this week. And number nine, don't get disenfranchised. Vote. And the quote from Pericles back in history is just because you don't take an interest in politics, it doesn't mean politics won't take an interest in you. And number ten, the most important, be vigilant. Take action. Always be on guard. Thomas Jefferson said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Here's some big solutions, some freedom solutions to go big or go home. Number one, which didn't make it to the slide, is reconciliation of budget where you can work with Congress and politicians to the extent which you can to defund bad laws that illegally take money from the budget. Number two that's pictured on the slide is nullification. In U.S. constitutional history, a legal theory that gives the state a right to nullify or invalidate any federal law which they deem unconstitutional. It simply requires activity at the state level. And I have some references, and there's a book, Nullification, How to Resist Federal Tyranny in the 21st Century by Thomas Woods, and I'm sure there are others. And at the bottom there, there's Convention of States, which is a very, very strong action that can be taken by states uh, versus the federal government. Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution allows states to call a convention of states to restrict the power and jurisdiction of the federal government and allows for constitutional amendments without the Congress or President's input or interference. It's just a state matter. And that's available at conventionofstates.com, and there's multiple movements if you so choose as individuals to get involved in them. All right, now we're going to bring it on home. Socialized healthcare and socialism. The world has seen it before. And uh, the late great former Prime Minister of uh, England, Margaret Thatcher, said, the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. And here's a parting thought from Thomas Jefferson, one of the founders of our country. I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of people under the pretense of taking care of them. So learn, think, and take action. Thank you.